Okay, so I think we are good to go. I'm going to go ahead and dive into this presentation, this workshop, this kind of master class that I've put together around holistic health and ADHD. Um, I know that we are in November here now, um, currently, even though in October, October is ADHD Awareness Month. And so I put together some resources, some ideas, some thoughts and perspectives around the topic of ADHD with a holistic health perspective. Um, and I'm really excited to dive into this, really excited to share this material with you and hopefully kind of bring out some insights, some additional information for you, perhaps um, even change your mind or change your perspective a little bit on how we integrate around uh, ADHD and how we kind of communicate with other people with this disorder of the brain and um, maybe some things for us to think about going forward. So with all that being said, my name is Jonathan Nisbill. I'm a registered dietitian, but overall I love to talk to people about all things holistic health and wellness. And so if you follow me at any point at this time, you know that I really care about the topic of ADHD. Um, I own my own business of Zigzag Nutrition, where I focus on um, nutrition and, and, and lifestyle wellness with people to actually help them improve their lives. Um, and an easy, kind of tangible, step-by-step -step process incorporating nutrition, not just from food, but nutrition as like a nourishing aspect of our lifestyle from sleep to stress management to physical activity. Um, to all the different areas of our health and wellness journey. Okay, so let me go ahead and jump in here. Okay, so what is ADHD? ADHD is a very interesting, not controversial topic at all, right? So everybody knows what it is. Everybody's super comfortable with the topic. Um, it's not anything controversial. It's nothing, um, nothing scary, right? So essentially ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, um, formerly known as ADD slash ADHD. Nowadays everybody just says ADHD, but even like historically, way back in the day, it was actually called Hyperactivity Syndrome in the literature, if you care about that, to, to look into it a little bit more, um, because they didn't, always, they didn't always have the term ADHD way back when. And so it's kind of known through the showcase, the highlights, of what someone's experience is, is the inattention, the hyperactivity, and the impulsivity that comes with it that you can see kind of manifesting in someone's behavior, right? So with that, with all kinds of different sorts of mental illnesses or mental health issues or brain disorders, um, metabolic disorders of the brain and, and different things like that, we typically have the person showcase their signs and symptoms and then we kind of layer that onto a diagnostic criteria and then we say, okay, you might have this disorder of the brain. There's not really any specific lab work or um, brain scans that would tell us specifically, oh, this person has this disease. Um, there's maybe some things with genetics that we've learned over the years that there's some correlation, but again, it's one of those things where if someone manifests these symptoms, these behavioral uh, struggles that they'll typically have, these challenges that I'll dive into in just a moment, then they are usually presented with a diagnosis of ADHD. So what are some of those challenges for someone with ADHD in their everyday life? So the executive functioning of the brain and the prefrontal cortex where they're planning, decision-making, they're actually um, struggling to make the cause and effect relationships and a lot of different things in their life. So not really understanding how their, beha how their behavior leads to certain outcomes, not really thinking things through very well. Um, they're not able to project kind of future visioning very well either. It's kind of like living in the moment sort of thing. Um, a lot of people say that ADHD is an inattention, but really it's a lack of ability to focus attention. Sometimes we talk about ADHD as if it's too much attention. We're bringing too much attention to too many things all at once. And so we can't actually focus that attention in one specific area. So there's that impulsivity, that impulse control that they are challenged with as well because they might just jump around from one topic to another or be unable to focus on someone speaking whenever there's a fly in the room or there's a noise from the air conditioner or someone in the classroom is also making noise and they can't focus that attention on the speaker that's trying to present information like in a classroom setting. Um, they might be challenged with organization, hormone regulation, stress management, um, self-esteem and confidence. So I've included this one because a lot of times individuals with ADHD struggle with the self-confidence and self-esteem, not necessarily because of some sort of genetic um, predisposition, but more so of how they integrate with their social community around them, 
whether it's with their students at school, um, fellow classmates, their teachers, their principal, guidance counselors, parents at home. Oftentimes, individuals with ADHD come from some struggled relationships that they've had to battle through um, through their life. And so there's not always a lot of um, positive feedback and positive reinforcement from those relationships to build up that self-esteem for them. And so they are at a greater risk for things like anxiety and depression related to um, that social structure as well. So they might be challenged with hypersensitivity to light, sound, noise, um, kind of chaos of emotions in the room, hypersensitive to, to smells, fragrances. They might, have, they might show that they have super hearing. They might be able to hear things um, more than other people to where it's kind of an acute um, sound, but it's very, the volume's really loud for them. They might be able to hear things that others aren't. They might struggle with time management. That's a big one. People talk about time blindness with ADHD, meaning that someone does not actually have a reference for time. Whenever someone says 30 minutes, we can kind of have a sixth sense, so to speak, to say, okay, 30 minutes is, is going to feel about this amount of time. Um, individuals with ADHD struggle to, again, with that future visioning, they struggle to have that time um, sense of, okay, what does 30 minutes feel like? And so they can either kind of sit around and get anxious waiting for 30 minutes to happen, or hyper-focus into a certain topic and forget that 30 minutes even went by, and then they're late for the next thing on their schedule. Okay, so that's just a, a kind of a brief overview. Um, again, there's other things that I've listed here, such as the blood sugar regulation as well to think about, but let's go ahead and move on. So, um, ADHD, again, um, has challenges, but it also has a lot of strengths. And so, in my mind, I think at large, we oftentimes talk about the challenges that people have with ADHD, but we forget to highlight and elevate the topic for those who actually have a, maybe a greater strength or a sense of creativity that other people don't. We forget to elevate them for the neuro, neurodivergent abilities, and we kind of like overlook them as we try to place them into a small little box. Um, and I could go on and talk about that a little bit more down the road, but people with ADHD are typically very, very creative. They have this kind of innate ability to be adventurous. They have a sense of being a strong leader. They really don't want to take advice or take suggestions, recommendations from other people. They would rather lead themselves. They'd rather be more active, more physically active outside. They typically have a greater sense of connection to nature and um, it helps them with their focus as well. And so they typically can find exercise or physical, physical activity as a great boost of endorphins for them, a great sense of focus and dopamine that would help the brain. I'll dive into that a little bit more as well later. And so um, as you can see here from, from these lists, so sometimes their strengths can be really good at speaking. They, they would like to speak their mind often. And so with impulsivity, they might actually be really good speakers, comedians, um, preachers, things like that. Um, they might be really good at problem solving because they can see a lot of different inter interconnected dots at the same time and see how they interrelate. And they're not necessarily going to overly focus on one thing at a time, but they actually can kind of small, acutely hyper-focus on each one and then see the big picture if that ADHD is well managed, if they've learned how to navigate and how to hone in on that skill. Um, whenever it comes to phys physical activity, they can have the potential to be really good at endurance sports because they have that, that, that drive, that um, they have a craving for, for physical activity and they don't really tire out very quickly. Um, they typically are very creative with music, with art. They are usually really good at drawing, really good at music. They have, a set, like, they have an ear for the sound of music to understand notes, to understand frequencies. Um, so they might be really good at music production as an example. Something to, think, something to think about there for someone who has ADHD to give them those tools early in life to allow their skills to develop early and often. Um, they would prefer to work with their hands typically, so they're usually better at home improvement, construction, gardening, agriculture, mechanics, auto mechanics, um, things like that. And so that's their natural innate ability, that's their preferences typically, versus more of that kind of like book uh, book work or working with pen and, pa and, and paper because it, it kind of puts them in a box and it can kind of suffocate them from that outward expression, that external energy that they need to get out, okay? So 
what is ADHD? Again, we're going to um, kind of nip the bud here a little bit and kind of end this section. But essentially, scientifically speaking, it's a neurobiological or neurodevelopmental disorder of the brain showcased by the inattention, trouble focusing, hyperactivity, and impulsivity that I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's highly related to the brain and body's regulation on some key neurotransmitters, uh, these chemicals that um, are messengers throughout the body and the brain. So um, you've probably heard of these things like dopamine, serotonin, and GABA, and those are dysregulated in the brain. Uh, like I said earlier, it's historically described as ADD and ADHD, but now it's kind of grouped together as ADHD. Um, and then leading physicians around the world have different perspectives on ADHD. Not everybody agrees exactly on how it's diagnosed, um, the certain kind of prognosis for ADHD as well. Different countries have different regulations, different protocols, different thoughts and theories on um, how ADHD is manifested, different ways on which we can um, give them tools, whether it's holistic lifestyle tools or medication management as well. And so different countries around the world actually might have a preference to send a child um, whenever they uh, have some trouble focusing in school towards something like nature therapy or working with a counselor or working um, towards a different style of education that's more uh, kinesthetics based. So it's more movement based before they even have a conversation around medication as an example. Okay, so I've just pulled a few different um, folks that I've learned from over the years, such as Dr. Daniel Amen, Dr. Gabor Mate, Russell Barkley, James Greenblatt, and, and others to kind of summarize some thoughts and perspective that, that they've shared over the years as leaders in the field with ADHD um, that I've been able to learn from myself. But again, this is not, a, this is not an exhaustive list, and there are many other um, ideas and perspectives around ADHD beyond what I'll be able to share today. Okay. So to touch on Dr. Daniel Amen's work um, a little bit, so Dr. Daniel Amen, he's a pretty famous uh, psychiatrist nowadays. Um, he's really famous for the Amen Clinics, if you're familiar with that term, and he has a, a really interesting brain scan technology that he's used over the years called SPECT, and that SPECT scan of brains, he's done that on hundreds of thousands of people, and at this point he's been able to develop a kind of pattern recognition from using the machine and just so much data behind the scenes to say, okay, people who come to his come into his office who have mental disorders of the brain um, that have been diagnosed, they scan their brain and they've compiled that data to see patterns and correlations across the board. So from all of his data, he has other mental disorders, but specifically around ADHD, he has then categorized them in seven different subtypes of ADHD based upon the pattern of the brain and it's showcasing um, function under that spec scan technology, okay? So those seven different subtypes are going to be classic, inattentive, overfocused, temporal, limbic, ring of fire, and anxious. And this is something that I, I think is really, really interesting. If you wanna dive into more information about this to see specifically what someone in your life or maybe your life um, yourself, if, you're, if you've been diagnosed with ADHD or thought that maybe that was your situation, to learn a little bit more about these subtypes to see if it fits your situation or the person that you're thinking about um, in the conversation around ADHD. And Dr. Daniel Amen, he's a leading physician at this point globally, but specifically here in the U.S., and he's actually got developed herbal botanical um, medication and supplement uh, protocols uh, tailored to these different subtypes depending on the person okay so if you want to look into that a little bit more just type in dr. Daniel Amen seven types ADHD and it will come up okay so talking a little bit about life with ADHD like I said earlier challenges with communication anxiety they really struggle with sleep oftentimes they typically are um, have the symptoms of insomnia as well, so they struggle with that sleep initiation. Their bodies don't have that really strong capability to initiate sleep, that sleep onset they struggle with to allow sleep to start with. The brain is always on, it's kind of always churning, um, always bouncing around in different directions, and so they struggle to initiate sleep in the evening. Um, due to many of the emotional sides of ADHD and how they might struggle with communication with friends or family or relationships. 
they might be at higher risk for depression and anxiety and um, be challenged with emotional coping skills that they just lack themselves. So it's really important to have open conversation around feelings and emotions early and often in someone's life and then give them practical tools to use in times of need before bad things happen. Okay. Um, the other thing that I'll say here in this slide specifically is that they are at a higher risk of substance abuse and addiction because the brain is hungry for something to focus on. The brain is hungry for a stimulant for something to hyper focus its, um, its lens of attention. Okay, So that could very well be a video game. That could very well be um, a siren going down the street all of a sudden. That person with ADHD is hyper focused and they're willing to be the firefighter to chase through the scene to save somebody's life. That is what their brain is craving all the time. It's like a gift to the brain. They just love it. They just want to they just want to relish in that experience of just getting this flooding of dopamine to the brain saying, hey, pay attention to this thing. Okay. And so that's the reason why maybe historically these individuals were thought to have a warrior gene inside of their gene coding that allowed them to maybe facilitate for the rest of the tribe or the rest of the village to be the warrior to go chase um, the, the hunt, the warrior to defend the tribe back at home because they just had that alert system on a kind of hyperdrive all the time to where they were willing to chase, adventure, run, sprint, um, and defend if needed when the time called. And so their brains were kind of turned on, hyper-focused in that moment to really thrive and protect others and provide for others. And so depending on their situation, they are at a higher risk for things like food addiction, such as sugar, carbohydrates, extravagant flavors, such as from our favorite tortilla chips or flavored candies or flavored snacks as well. I'll dive in a little bit more information about that later on. Um, but again, one of the other reasons why they might be at a higher risk for substance abuse and addiction is that a lot of people will try to um, do like a self-coping mechanism through marijuana, through marijuana or vaping as an example with nicotine. Um, they might also be um, struggling with that impulse control, right? So if they are impulsive and they're not able to future vision very well and see the cause and effect relationship, well, it's pretty simple to understand that they would be more susceptible to taking a substance quickly without thinking it through and if someone offers them something or if someone hands them something or if they're in an environment where it's being offered around they will impulsively take it without thinking ahead try it and then all of a sudden the brain gets a surge of energy that flooding of dopamine or serotonin and all of a sudden that person is hooked the brain is hooked because there was no filter, there was no defense, there was no guardian to protect the brain from making that behavioral decision quickly in that setting. So they can be taken advantage of in a very easy way because they are more vulnerable to that because they don't have that filtering capability as well as what some other folks do. Okay, So there's many, many other layers to that that I won't dive into right now. That's a very, um, very deep conversation that could last hours in and of itself. Okay. So again, touching on the challenges, now I'll touch on the skills and strengths. So artistic abilities, writing music, painting, drawing, music production, like I mentioned earlier, adventure and exploration, oftentimes if you take them outdoors and you put them with a group, they will, be want, they will want to be at the front of the pack. They will want to be the ones leading everybody else because they're gonna get bored and anxious being in the back. <laughs> they're gonna be wanting to run in the front no matter what and then tell everybody what, um, what the best part of the adventure is and lead them on the best adventure as a group, okay? Um, they're really good at working with their hands, physical activity, endurance sports, oftentimes um, activities like swimming, running, cycling, and strength training specifically are very good activities for someone with ADHD because it's working all the body movements and really pushing them um, with cross-functional training as well because it's using both parts of the brain at different times, using different limbs versus just kind of like standing still in an outfield as a left fielder in baseball. Um, like I said, they're typically good at home improvement. And then as far as skills and, and abilities in school, usually, usually speaking, they are better at math, chemistry, and physics 
than language arts, reading, or let's say something like social studies, okay? So, um, holistic health pathways with ADHD. Um, my, my point on this subtopic here is looking at more of that holistic picture around therapies, okay? So this could include ADHD specific coaching with an ADHD certified coach, which is a thing and it is growing tremendously. Highly recommend to look into that for adults, especially around productivity and an employer and really allowing their strengths to come to, come to the surface um, the most. Uh, nutritional inter intervention, that's where someone like myself would come in or another physician that's kind of trained in, in a nutritional protocol for someone with ADHD to actually support their needs biologically in the brain to understand what the brain's nutrients require more so than the average person. And then also looking at nutritional deficiencies as an example, or even like gut microbiome differences because a lot of people with ADHD often struggle with um, forgetting to eat, forgetting to drink. They might struggle with constipation, um, with ear, like uh, not having a routine around nutrition, and typically they gravitate towards more of those extravagant flavors or uh, sweetened drinks, high sugar foods, um, and and other things that I could tie that I could talk to you about because of that lack of self-regulation, that lack of impulse control, and other things. Okay, then we could talk about physical activity as another therapeutic tool and exercise, like I mentioned high quality sleep. I can't emphasize that enough. Sleep is extremely important as well as breath work and, and retraining um, proper breath through the nose and out through the mouth as compared to mouth breathing, mouth breathing overnight or struggling with asthma or allergies and a stuffy nose in the middle of the night, which a lot of kids do, and that causes a stress response during the night and doesn't allow for high quality sleep. Okay. Other modes of therapy would be CBT, EFT, EMDR. Um, so as an example, look into those if you're interested in more therapeutic options. There's also neurofeedback and talk therapy and other things to think about. Okay, so life with ADHD. Let me just set forth a picture of some myths that I'm willing to bust and some controversies that you've probably heard yourself, some statements that may or may not be true, okay? So a lot of people think that ADHD is the same for everybody, but it's not. ADHD looks different in every single person. Yes, there are trends and patterns that we can recognize across the board, but it is pretty different for most people, okay? Specific to their situation. Having, having ADHD doesn't mean you can't focus. Like I said earlier, it means that you can focus. In fact, you can hyper-focus. It's just the fact that you can't bring your attention to sp something specifically sometimes when you want it to if you're not more interested in it. You have a lot of focus. You're focusing on so many things all at once and say so you can't focus that attention on one thing, but you can if it's well managed. ADHD is not just a childhood condition. A lot of, adult, a lot of adults struggle with ADHD. A lot of adults um, are actually diagnosed as adults with ADHD as well. In our modern life t today with technology and stimulant, um, Stimulating screens and, and flavors and technologies and advertisements and media don't make it very um, easier. It doesn't make it um, any more easier for folks, okay? So medication is not always the answer. It's also not the only answer for people, right? There are other lifestyle techniques to use. Not everyone with ADHD is hyperactive. Like I said earlier, there are other subtypes of ADHD where they may not showcase the hyperactivity. They might show more of the inattention. They might show more of the anger management side of things as well. ADHD often occurs with other mental conditions such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, and others. Short-term memory struggles are a daily reality. They might have long-term memory, they might have the um, a struggle like forgetting where their keys are, forgetting where their water bottle is, forgetting homework, things like that, and that short-term memory bank. And then ADHD is affected by outside stress. This is really big because outside stress, outside of our body, in our environment, whether it's friends, family, relationships, home, school, work, all of those environments can be stressful for the ADHD brain to be overwhelmed by and affects that memory and affects that attention, right? Three times as many men are diagnosed with ADHD compared to women. Causes of ADHD have almost doubled in the um, cases, I should say cases of ADHD have almost doubled in the past decade and are only on the rise now. ADHD care costs approximately $42.5 billion annually. It's 
quite a lot if you think about it. That's not just the medication side of things, that's additional accidents, emergencies, um, loss of work, um, other costs involved from someone struggling with ADHD symptoms, and then kind of the effect of something that's happened behind the scenes for them. So some additional stats here for us to think about. So 10% of children between ages three and 17 years old are diagnosed. Rates, if you only look at boys alone, are much higher than just one in 10. Okay, that 10, that 10%, that one in 10 kids in a classroom, that rate is higher for boys. So the average classroom at school, let's say there's 20 kids in there, on average, two of those individuals are going to be diagnosed with ADHD by the time they graduate high school. If you only put boys in a classroom and you only have 20 boys in a classroom, it's likely you're gonna see five or more of those kids diagnosed with ADHD, okay? Um, by race and ethnicity there, as you can see, there's some skewed perspectives or some skewed statistics with the um, black non-Hispanic group having a higher propensity for ADHD diagnosis as compared to the Asian population, non-Hispanic, right? It's very interesting to think about whenever you have data that speaks to something being almost five times more in the black non-Hispanic community than the Asian community. Is it because of education? Is it because of parent household dynamics? Is it because of demographics in the community? Is it because of an education style difference? There's a lot of things for us to talk about. We could dive into that more. It's a very interesting um, avenue of conversation to really explore, okay? So um, other coexisting diagnoses, like I mentioned earlier, anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, anxiety disorders, behavioral problems at school, at work, at, in life in general. Maybe they're more highly provoked on the street with people saying something that they shouldn't. 85% of people diagnosed experience mild to moderate symptoms of ADHD. So not everybody has severe symptoms. Not everybody has um, a, a very severe symptomology to where they struggle with everyday life. A lot of people can find a way to self-manage through exercise, good nutrition, good lifestyle, stress management, good relationships, and other things, okay? So I've told you all of these things, but I really haven't told you about myself or why I even care about this topic so much. So my perspective as a nutrition professional, I use food as medicine in my practice with working with individuals, families, kids, um, adults, every, everybody across the spectrum of age, right, in different, in different demographics. So I have a master's in nutrition and dietetics. Great. Okay, cool. That's wonderful. So that means I went to school and I learned a lot whenever I was there. I got good grades. That's fine. So that's my background, but my, my real strong interest is actually helping people have practical tools, insights and information and education and empowerment to help them live their best lives possible, right? So this is one of those areas that I feel like we don't talk about enough, it's overlooked, it's misunderstood, and it's got misconceptions behind it as well and controversies. Um, but I'm really fascinated with this area of ADHD because I think that so many people in our history have had ADHD and they have been such innovators, such strong-minded um, willpower of individuals, strong leaders, strong dynamic entrepreneurs as well that have led us in a, in a very positive direction, creative artists, music, drawing, painting, sculpture, and years and years past, 100 years ago, right? Thousands of years ago. These people have always been here who have this certain kind of brain neurodivergency, but it's only in our modern era that we poorly serve and we actually increase their vulnerabilities, we increase their risks because of our modern technology, because of our modern lifestyles, because of our sedentary lifestyles in America especially. So I'm really interested in this topic because I have a family, um, per, uh, personal family that I've had who have struggled with ADHD, okay? So maybe it runs in your genetic line. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you have a, a friend though that you know who has ADHD. I almost guarantee you if one in 10 people is diagnosed today, that, you're, that you know at least one person. I, like, I, I bet you even know one to five people, just you yourself, who have ADHD. And you can see it in their experience if it's not your experience yourself. And yeah, we can joke and have fun and say, oh, that's just my ADHD if we forget our keys, or we can kind of joke and say, oh, I must have ADHD if I forgot that what I read on the news this morning, or if I, um, if I forgot something at work, or if I feel like a squirrel and I'm jumping around from different topic to different topic, 
cool, it's fun, it's a joke, yeah, but not everybody has that fun experience saying that about ADHD. A lot of people feel challenged, poor self-esteem, poor self-confidence, um, really that mental battle with even the diagnosis, okay? So I care about this topic a lot. I almost guarantee that you have somebody in your life who this is affected and they walk through this themselves, okay? And in my perspective as a nutrition professional is holistic. It's the whole person, their whole life, their whole mind, body, spirit connection, their physical, emotional, spiritual, um, social, cultural, um, environmental, uh, wellness. That's all interconnected, okay? And I take the perspective in the nutritional realm alone around nutritional psychiatry, essentially how nutrition can be utilized to support the brain or support our psychiatry our psyche, our character, our integrity, how we think about ourselves, okay? And this is a really important field that's developing over the last five to 10 years in the areas of recovery, addiction, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders as well in other areas, okay? So I have other additional education in youth mental health, um, certified in that in, in college. I mean, took certification courses in environmental medicine. So yes, I understand all of our water is filled with chemicals, all right? Yes, I understand. It's frustrating. Trust me. I know. I know about it. Yes, a lot of workplaces that people go to for work, the air is 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 bad. Okay, there's runoffs that the company is providing in the water. There's dioxins in the air. There's pesticides on our on our crops. And yes, I know. I know all of those different things. And they they all have make an impact, right? So that's all to say. I kind of have some education behind the scenes to back up my perspective on these things. Do you need to listen to me specifically? No. Not at all. We all have different kind of credentials, different life experience, different ways in which we've been able to kind of rise up with some insight and information in our lives. I'm not saying that I'm the person who knows the most. I'm just saying I might know a little bit more than the average Joe about this conversation. And hopefully I can kind of frame this in a way that challenges our perspective, our narrative story about ADHD, and provide a, a, a glimpse of a greater light at the end of the tunnel and provide some hope for us. Okay, so... Um, care about this lot, care about this topic a lot, and then it's for personal, my family, kids in schools. I'm really passionate about them, um, all families in general. And then another area that's kind of overlooked and misunderstood is how employers can actually leverage the individuals in their workforce with ADHD to allow them to shine and lead and be the high productive, performance-driven uh, people that they can be. Okay, so let's move on now after I've talked about myself enough. <laughs> okay. So like I said, my perspective is that I question the status quo. I want to investigate all of the interactions on the body, the brain, the spirit, the environment. I want to respect the root cause. I come from a background learning nutrition from a perspective of functional medicine. Functional medicine looks at the root cause analysis on why this thing is even happening. Why is the symptom there? Even if it has a diagnosis, it, has, it does not tell you anything about why it's happening. All the diagnosis is, is, a, is a label to label a set of signs and symptoms for us to better understand it from a medical and clinical side of things. Typically, only to give it down a path of medication. But if we respect the root cause, then we really analyze and assess the root cause in order to address the root cause from a therapeutic standpoint. Is it because of a yeast infection? Is it because of a microbiome um, dysfunction, a, a microbiome overgrowth issue? Is it because of a parasite, as an example? Is it mineral deficiencies in magnesium and omega-3 vitamin D? Is it because of an early childhood trauma that someone had in their early life that's led to their body to be kind of stuck in this fight or flight response? Again, we respect the root cause and we're looking at the whole person understanding that their set of signs and, signs and symptoms today are there because of something else behind the scenes. It did not just happen overnight. This is the fruit of the tree, but we need to look at the roots to see why the fruit is the way it is today, okay? So we, under, we understand the underlying systems of the body from nutritional psychiatry to met, metabolic disorders of the brain to understand how all those different nutrients, how all the different hormones and neurotransmitters and the environment work together to develop the brain's status and overall functioning. We swim upstream to find out what is going on upstream for the effects that we see downstream. We see the downstream effects of the challenges in school with handwriting, the challenges in school with attention, 
but we swim upstream to say, okay, what is this kid having for breakfast? Okay, what does this kid's household look like? Okay, how was this kid sleep the night before? A lot, a lot of times, people ignore those components. They do not swim upstream. They only see the downstream effects, and they never ask the questions of what's causing what we see today. We give away the greatest insight. So, as I practice my my own way in zigzag nutrition, my own private practice, and what I try to show up in my own life is try to give out my greatest insights to everybody else that I possibly can, and then allow other people to come to me to ask more questions, to work with me privately, um, to work with group group coaching, other mentorship programs. But I don't want people to feel like they need me and they depend on me to be able to thrive. I want to be able to give all the tools and tips and hints and tricks, all the empowerment to the individual, to the family. Because if I die tomorrow, if I get hit by a bus, I want them to be able to have all the tools they need to be able to, su to succeed going forward. Okay, and then um, I offer the opportunity for health and healing through education, sharing of information, sharing of community, providing hope, um, showcasing optimism, optimism and positivity around different topics in health and wellness um, and then just really empowering people to move in the right direction for themselves okay i believe every person deserves the, at least the chance to learn a little bit more about their body to learn a little bit more about their brain and how their environment affects both so they can then lead themselves going forward with the inside the information the education to then be an in, fully informed person about all of these different mechanisms to then be able to make their own best decisions, right? If anybody wants to listen to me for two hours, talk, and I give them all the information, they say, oh yeah, all that stuff makes sense for my life, but I don't want to do that. That's their decision. I'm not here to force anything. I'm just saying, here's how these things affect your body. Here's how Pop-Tarts in the morning will affect your brain compared to a uh, balanced breakfast of an avocado, some eggs, and some toast, as an example, okay? So where do we go from here? Well, I approach things from a holistic health perspective, as I mentioned right now, okay? We're gonna dive into some common concerns and considerations around ADHD. I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about lifestyle medicine, how lifestyle medicine can approach ADHD in a very different way than just medications alone. I'm gonna talk about nutrient interactions. I'm gonna talk about the potential for food and supplement protocols as well. I'll touch only briefly on that because I do typically high, um, really individualize that and personalize that for the um, person I'm working with. I'll provide some additional resources at the end, and then, of course, this is a free educational workshop, but I do offer the opportunity for more information and coaching with me privately um, at the very end, okay? So stick with me to the end to learn a little bit more about that. If you have any questions right now, go ahead and comment um, on whatever post this is, this video is at, whether it's on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram. Let me know what questions you have specifically, and I will get back to you, okay? So lifestyle medicine is a practice of medicine that's really on the rise right now because that's allowing physicians and, and health professionals to practice like they wanted to versus kind of only being there for a script um, or medication management, right? That's how a lot of physicians have to practice nowadays. But lifestyle medicine is actually there from a prevent, preventative side, proactive side, and actually really reducing medication uh, dependency and helping people improve their lifestyles to showcase, to manifest, to have the fruition of health at the end of the road as they adjust their lifestyle, as they nourish the soils beneath the tree, so to speak. So imagine the soil being our sleep, our nutrition, our movement, our healthy relationships and community, our stress management tools, our avoidance of different substances, um, our hope and positivity for the world around us, and that leads the tree to produce better fruit. But if all of those diff different areas of our life and wellness are dysfunctional, well, that's the reason why the fruit is rotting on the side of the tree. So ADHD and nutrition, um, it's, again, my kind of area of focus, right? So whenever I think about common considerations for someone with ADHD in the nutritional realm, I have to ask, are you eating enough? Are you eating on a routine? Are you having three meals a day? Because oftentimes people forget to eat, whether that's just because of their ADHD or the medication they're on. Medication can also be an appetite suppressant oftentimes. And so you take somebody who forgets to eat already, then you give them an, an appetite suppressant, and they forget to eat all day. And then all of a sudden, it's 2 a.m., they're, they're up at night watching television, and they have a giant hunger overload. It's very common. Then they eat a bunch of food, then they're up until 4, 
then they go to sleep and then they sleep till noon the next day okay hydration are you drinking enough water um as i mentioned earlier sometimes there's these layered experiences of people with adhd where they're hypersensitive to smell taste sound um, sometimes there's some sensory difficulties with certain foods whether it's certain textures mushy consistencies um, maybe they had a food with other um, uh, textural contrast that's going on like macaroni and cheese is fine but macaroni and cheese with chicken makes it very different or macaroni and cheese with broccoli makes it very different and so they struggle with those sensory difficulties um, you might see some picky eating as an aside with that poor food choices overall usually because their brain is hardwired for some sort of stimulating experience right so whenever you hand someone with ADHD Takis that are an extravagantly flavored uh, tortilla chip snack. It's a very stimulating brain endorphin release that that person can experience through that snack that the brain is craving, that the brain is longing for all the time, right? So that snack offers the brain that that resp that response, that relief, and then that brain remembers that, and it wants that again and again and again and again. Um, that's just one example. You can say the same thing with sugary drinks. You can say the same thing with different foods. Um, I could talk about gluteomorphins and caseomorphins and how those are morphine-like receptors, um, how they impact morphine-like receptors in the brain and then overstimulate for cheese and dairy and breads and pastas and tortillas and things like that. They're susceptible to ultra-processed foods, right? So this is American food. This is all of the wonderful American food that we've been able to develop over the last 150 years through manufactured factories, right? So we take all of the wonderful food that's um, just provided to us um, as creation, right? This is creation among us with real whole food. And then we take all the nutrients out of it. We run it through all these different manufacturing processes. Then we provide additive ingredients to it. And then we say, hey, buy this from the grocery store, right? So I'm being a little bit cynical here as it's sarcasm, but um, they're, sim they're sensitive and susceptible to ultra processed foods because these foods have been designed for overconsumption. These foods have been designed for hyper palatability. They have been manufactured for you to overconsume them and for them to not work with your brain's self-regulatory pathways. They overdrive, they overstep your brain's self regulatory pathways your brain does not know how to respond to a bag of potato chips your brain does not know how to respond to a pop tart to say i think i'm full it is not biologically designed to do that those are new foods in the last 250 years in the last i don't know 100 years let's say compared to the thousands of years that humans have been here all right our genetics have not adapted to things like that and they likely never will all right so they are typically symptoms increase with sugar, dyes, colors, flavors, artificial ingredients. Oftentimes people with ADHD have a hypersensitivity to different food allergies. Um, food sensitivities as well, corn, wheat, uh, soy, gluten, dairy, um, sometimes oats, sometimes strawberries, tomatoes, bananas. Um, sometimes there's like random things that come up on on people's uh, experiences too, right? So maybe I mentioned gluten, gluten's another big one. Constipation concerns for all the things that I mentioned so far. And if we think about ADHD from an inflammatory uh, standpoint, inflammation in the body, inflammation in the brain, that leads to poor digestion, that leads to leaky gut, that leads to the inability to actually digest and absorb our nutrients properly. Delayed gastric emptying, especially with the appetite suppressant medication, forgetting to eat then the person does not have a routine with regulatory bowels and then they deal with constipation um, medication interactions it's kind of self-explanatory medication impacts adhd all right common nutrient concerns and yes i know i'm going quickly through this presentation because i want you to be able to get as a, get a lot of the information here today um, for free right this is a free workshop so i'm going to provide you again with all the information that i can in this presentation hopefully without trying to overwhelm you too much, but maybe you can go back and, and re-watch it or take notes or put it at half speed or something, <laughs> but, um, or just follow up with me personally to ask me more questions, right? Um, and then share with the community, right? Because we all have different questions, we all have different perspectives and different experiences. And so um, if you have a question to ask, ask that question, because I guarantee you somebody else in the community has that same question, all right? So 
common nutrient concerns I mentioned earlier, magnesium, vitamin D, B vitamins, specifically methylated B vitamins, compared to the synthetic B vitamins that you might be able to find from a multivitamin or fortified foods. Zinc, iron, copper, strong minerals that the body needs, that the brain needs. Individuals with ADHD are typically deficient in all of these things that I mentioned in this slide. They are typically deficient in magnesium, vitamin D, B vitamins, zinc, iron, copper, omega-3 fatty acids that are very helpful for inflammation, driving down inflammation, amino acids, which come from protein foods, and fiber. Herbs and supplements in ADHD. Okay, so this slide has a lot of information on it, right? Am I going to talk about all these different things? No. I highlight this to tell you, hey, there are other things to think about. ADHD is not a deficiency in Ritalin. ADHD is not a deficiency in Adderall. So, yes, some people use herbs and supplements to help support their brain's needs of nutrients. We could talk about valerian root, how some people chew on valerian root to help them sleep at night. We could also talk about chamomile and passionflower tea, which can also be very soothing. We can talk about SAMe and 5-HTP that can help the brain relax at night before bed. We can talk about saffron. A little interesting fun fact here with saffron literature and the research, saffron works on par from the research. It has worked on par with the, some leading ADHD medications such as methylphenidate. So in the literature, saffron was placed um, in comparison groups with a saffron extract compared to methylphenidate. And the results showed saffron provided the kind of on par results for reduction in symptoms of ADHD compared to methylphenidate, <clears throat> which is a leading ADHD medication. But saffron came with no extra side effects. Methylphenidate comes with lots of different side effects. Okay. That doesn't mean that medication can't be part of the picture. Um, I know my perspective is, might be a little bit more biased here it's just because I'm a fan of all things natural health and wellness. Um, so I don't, mean to, I don't mean to discount medication. I don't mean to um, say that it can't be part of the picture. But there are other options that come with less side effects. There are also other supplements, such as some of these amino acids that are here, such as L-tryptophan, L-tyrosine, L-theanine. That can be helpful, right? I touched on amino acids earlier. Yes, I think a lot of people with ADHD benefit from going on an omega-3 supplement, as an example. Some physicians like to, like to utilize lithium with an ADHD medication and supplement protocol. Um, other, other therapies would, might include looking at a food sensitivity test or a food allergy test to see if any of those symptoms are kind of exacerbated whenever a child has a certain food. So maybe this child is sensitive to eggs. They don't know how to communicate that. They're just dealing with um, a parent or a caretaker making eggs on a consistent basis and their bodies are not really dealing with it in a very good way. They're dealing with digestive issues, they're getting inflamed, they showcase ag aggression and irritable mood and behavioral issues after eating eggs. Well, let's do a food sensitivity test or food allergy test and see if there's anything behind the scenes that we can kind of pinpoint to see if we can move these things around, maybe exchange eggs for other foods in the morning, see if it makes a difference, okay? So there's other things that are going on. Um, I could talk to you more about how all of these different things play with the brain activity with kind of allowing the, the brain to be better supported through different nutrients, um, lowering inflammation, feeling more therapeutic as far as relaxation, meditation, and things like that. But um, let's go ahead and move on for now. So from a functional medicine perspective, um, again, that's kind of my background in nutrition. That's where I come from. That world, that's how, I'm, that's how those are the glasses that I wear every day as a functional medicine person. And so functional lab testing is perhaps part of that protocol that you can explore with ADHD where you might look at micronutrient panels, you might look at yeast, you might look at the food sensitivities like I mentioned, environmental toxins like okay is the tap water in someone's home high in mercury or lead or um, is it uh, iron, co iron coated uh, pipes that are underneath the house and so it's causing iron overload in someone with ADHD. Are there heavy metals in the drinking water at school perhaps? Um, how are their detoxification pathways looking? Do they, have the, do they have the genetics of someone who has a predisposition for dysfunctional um, bioproduction or 
um, a lack of cholesterol management or perhaps they have an MTHFR gene SNP that causes some, some difficulties in, in methylation issues in the body. Um, you could look at immune function panels, you can look at food allergies, and then that's more on the functional side, the integrative side of things. This is where we talk about lifestyle medicine, this is where we would talk about other therapeutic tools, um, more of that coaching style as well. Um, you could also look at maybe this person has a subluxation in their spine in a specific area that's causing irritability. They don't even know that the subluxation is causing more of a psychiatric issue. So you use an integrative approach to assess them as a whole person. Maybe you have a massage therapist, maybe you have a chiropractor, do an assessment, work with them on that subluxation. That subluxation is released and then that person feels a lot better. They can finally sleep. Speaking about sleep, looky there. Perfect timing, right? So ADHD and sleep is by far the number one most important thing in my book. If you can't sleep, you can't heal. If you can't sleep, your body can't regulate. If you can't sleep, your body can't um, process old cells and then allow room for new cells. That autophagy that happens overnight, that body's cellular cleanup, where we take out the trash, we clean up the house, we make it look nice by the, by the time in the morning, make sure our thoughts and feelings and emotions are organized, and we don't sleep, none of that happens, all right? So, like I said earlier, people with ADHD struggle with sleep typically. Sleep is the most important thing in my book to start off with. Interestingly enough, whenever I work with individuals, I kind of do a, a sleep chronotype assessment to see where this person is at um, with their brain pattern to see, okay, is their circadian rhythm off? Are they maybe one of the percentages of the population who follow a different chronotype? So there are different sleep chronotypes, specifically in the context of ADHD, to consider where maybe this person's brain pattern is following a different chronotype that it would suggest maybe they would be optimized through um, timing their wake up, timing food, timing exercise, um, timing sleep, initiation at different times of the day compared to the average person that actually allows their brain to be the best of their own abilities to facilitate their own specific unique needs and their brain's pattern. And it doesn't, um, it allows them not to feel so frustrated in comparison to the average person. Whenever the average person is asked to, to wake up at 6.30, to go to work by 8, to come home at 5, to eat dinner, and go to bed at 9 p.m. The person with ADHD doesn't really want to follow that routine. Honestly, they usually don't, okay? So in comparison, if you can allow someone to understand how their brain is uniquely designed to function in XYZ way, it gives them a better margin to say, okay, this is me. This is how I can be most productive. My most productive time is actually 8 to 10 p.m. If that's the case, beautiful. You can be productive. At, you can be most productive at 8 to 10 p.m. Okay, plan for that. Let's wear blue light blocking glasses. Let's put a blue light filter on your computer. Let's allow your, your lights in your home to be dimmed. That way you're not projecting your sleep pattern to make you awake at 2 a.m., right? But use that productivity hack to your advantage and to know your brain best. Um, with sleep as well, we can talk about exercise routines and different supplements to help that person sleep best because sleep is so important. ADHD and exercise. So let's see here. Okay, traditional cardio can be helpful to be, people with ADHD, can be very good at endurance sports like I mentioned earlier. Most people with ADHD find at some point exercise is like the best drug for them. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I don't mean that in a, in a crude way. I mean that in a, in a very authentic way. Like they typically will end up loving exercise if they allow themselves to, to use exercise as the therapeutic tool for the brain long enough. It might stink in the very beginning. It might be hard to, to get that routine set. But once you allow for that endorphin release to happen to the brain through exercise time and time again, it becomes very, very um, beneficial for the brain. The brain starts to crave it over and over and over. They usually really enjoy it, and it can be a very therapeutic tool for them, okay? With exercise, thinking about outdoor activities, um, sports and competitions, whenever you're outdoors, you can also get some additional sunlight for vitamin D. Um, sunlight also helps the brain regulate dopamine and melatonin through sunlight interactions through our eyes. Um, and then other cross-functional activities, like I mentioned earlier um, in our presentation today, that swimming and tennis as an example with kind of like lateral movements using multiple different parts of the body at the same time can be beneficial to get the the brain active in, in multiple regions 
And believe it or not, these individuals on the right side of this slide, Michael Jordan, one of the most famous names around the world as an athlete, Shaquille O'Neal, Karina Smirnoff, Michael Phelps, Simone Biles, Magic Johnson, Muhammad Ali. This is just a brief list of individuals who have had ADHD diagnosis who are world-class athletes, multiple gold Olympians. So if you think that you have ADHD and you can't be a leader, you think that you can't function at your best ability, that you can't be a high performer, you are wrong. This is just a brief example. ADHD in nature. Okay, nature is another therapeutic tool that is like foundational. So in my book, like sleep, exercise, nature, all extremely wonderful therapeutic tools, no side effects, right? So um, vitamin D we can get from being outside a lot more. Sunlight, like I mentioned earlier, can be helpful for um, vitamin D, sleep regulation. We get more oxygen whenever out, we are outside. Um, individuals with ADHD as well. So here's a really interesting thing to think about. Whenever we look at something very close to our eyes like this, it, pro it promotes an agitated response. Our brain and our body and our eyes don't really like things to be up front in our face, right? We kind of get a little bit aggressive, defensive, agitated. So what do we do every day, all day? We look at screens. We look at screens right here in front of our face, right? That's not at all what our brain is designed for. So individuals with ADHD are more susceptible to screen addiction, yes, but also if that is the case, they are much more benefited by having screens put away. Having what I call optic freedom, whenever we go outside, we look in far distances, we go to a mountain and we look out for miles and miles and miles and miles. We go to a beach and we look out across the sunset or sunrise for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. And miles. That's called optic freedom, okay? And then optic freedom communicates to the brain, look at all this open space. Wow, there's miles and miles and miles and miles of safety. Wow, there's miles and miles and miles and miles of security and comfort and relaxation. And I don't have anything to be worried about right now in this moment. So there's a reason why our brains and our bodies and humans across time have always enjoyed those moments of optic freedom to look out far, okay? Another tool to think about for your everyday experiences. Nature allows us to be more adventurous, it stimulates dopamine to the brain. It's using multifunction um, abilities from our senses, uh, multi -sense, multi sensory capabilities. It's, uh, you can impact your sense of smell, your sense of taste, your sense of sound, touch, okay? It impacts all of our senses whenever we are outside in nature. And it allows for an emotional release. You've probably heard places in like Japan, they actually prescribe forest bathing, essentially going out in nature to help you emotionally release trauma, depression, anxiety. Nature heals. Nature heals. It's not foo-foo, it's not whimsical, it's not fantastical, it's not fiction, it's not mystical, it's not fantasy. It's real. It's realistic, it's practical, it's tactical, it's strategic, it's authentic. It's real. We need it. Okay. Connection to nature impacts us in so many different ways. People with ADHD typically have a very fond connection to nature because their brains relax more whenever they're in nature more. Really helps reduce the risks of depression, anxiety, and PTSD and other things whenever they spend more time in nature. Okay. Nature is my medicine. Nature can be your medicine. Okay. ADHD and parenting styles. I could spend weeks just on this part alone, okay? When we raise kids who we think might have ADHD or who already have an ADHD diagnosis, parenting styles, parenting coaching can be very beneficial to help parents learn proper language, communication skills, organizational skills around the home, leadership, mentorship, ways in which we can communicate to individuals with ADHD as kids to help them see themselves as a gifted mind versus um, a mind who feels restricted or damaged or disordered. The terms we use, the words we use, are very, very important. There's a lot of reasons why the words that we use make such an impact for somebody. They will, they will rise to the occasion of whatever words are spoken to them 
or whatever narrative story is said about them. So if someone is told as a child, you have bad behavior, you don't understand things, you are too aggressive, you are too dumb, you can't sit still. All of those things are negative feedbacks, negative feedback to the brain. They can be very shaming, very condescending, very condemning, very damaging and negative to the brain, right? So our words matter. If we say to a kid, you can't sit still, yes, I understand it might be true, okay? There's a way to do that in a very lovingly way versus you can't sit still. Can you please, right? There's a difference. There's a difference in how we communicate that. Jimmy, you can't sit still, man. Why don't you just get up from the table and do some jumpy jacks, then you can tackle your homework a little bit better, right? There's a way to communicate things in a, in a lot better light. So parenting styles are really important. In this slide, I have a column, um, one column on the left, one column on the right, in different ways in which we can kind of analyze parenting styles, uh, just as a brief example, right? So some parents are hypercritical, they're disorganized, they have high expectations, they have maybe trauma in their own background, right? That they're trying to work through, that they're trying to kind of work through as parents themselves. Um, they're more reactive than they are responsive. They might even have ADHD themselves. They might have genetical, genetic issues um, with predispositions to mental illness or mental health disorders and emotional instability as compared to emo emotional stability. Those are some parents that make it very, very difficult for someone as a kid with ADHD to succeed, to feel loved, nourished, relaxed, um, calm, okay? Compared to a household is, who is strategic, they're supportive, they're organized, they're creative, they're hopeful, they're grace-filled, they're loved, they provide love first, they have a strong sense of family systems, and they provide a lot of structure for that kid. I mean, I'm sure you're just listening to me right now and being like, wow, you know what? This makes a lot of sense. I could completely empathize with this or that. I can completely empathize with the fact that this family dynamic system is is damaging, it's structurally insufficient for someone with ADHD, whereas that one over there, you know, that one would be very, very helpful, you know, it'd be very, very helpful. And I know parents on both sides of the spectrum, right? So I'm sure you, you probably do too. So I know parents who are super str strategic, they're supportive, they're creative with supporting their kids with ADHD, they make all these different color-coded cards and tables and charts and all that kind of stuff. Not everybody has that potential as like an innate ability or like a very quick skill that they can develop. I think everybody can learn those things, um, but the parenting style really makes a big impact from that child's um, upbringing from that like kind of six to 17 years old time frame. I mean, yes, of course, before that too, but that personality development from like six to 17 is really important. And like I said, our words matter, okay? So let me just uh, give you a moment here to take a look at this slide. Just read it to yourself. How many names do you recognize on this list? I don't know, there's maybe 30, 35 different names on this list. I bet you can recognize several, right? John F. Kennedy, Justin Bieber, uh, depending on your generation, maybe you're a fan of Justin Timberlake, maybe you're a fan of Michael Faraday, from a Faraday cage perspective, if you're if you know what I'm talking about there, maybe that's an inside joke. Um, uh, maybe it's astronaut Scott Kelly. Maybe you're a really big fan of, of uh, astrology and space travel. What about Benjamin Franklin? I'm sure you probably know about Benjamin Franklin, right? Um, what about Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, Wolfgang Mozart, John Lennon, Will Smith, Woody Harrelson, Zoe Deschanel, Will I Am, Johnny Depp, Channing Tatum, Emma Watson, Ryan Gosling, Walt Disney. Walt Disney, Heidi Klum, Simon Cowell, Mel B, Howie Mandel, Bill Gates, Nikola Tesla, Isaac Newton, Jamie Oliver. What about Howie Mandel, Mel B, Simon Cowell, Heidi Klum? What do all those people have in common? They are all judges on America's Got Talent. And these are all highly talented people who have ADHD. Believe it or not, all of these individuals on this list 
have been supposedly, I found tons of different lists online, so I corroborated this as much as I could, but all of these people have been diagnosed with ADHD. And all of these people are extremely successful in their careers. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have ADHD or you know someone who has ADHD and you feel shame and you feel guilt and you feel lousy, well, guess what? There are hundreds, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world who have ADHD who are extremely successful. There's been books written about people with ADHD who actually have been able to leverage their ADHD to have an advantage in the marketplace compared to a disadvantage. It's all about the stories that we tell ourselves. It's all about the narratives. It's all about the storyline. Back to that reason for parenting styles. There's a reason why parenting styles is so important. If you are brought up in a positive vocabulary um, household and a positive narrative storyline, you have a lot better at, you have a lot better chances at finding success than your peers who are brought up in a negative household. Some of these individuals might be a little bit more eccentric. Uh, I'll give you credit there, such as uh, Nikola Tesla, Louis Pasteur, Isaac Newton, Alexander Graham Bell, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein. They were eccentric in their time. You know what? But they were extremely innovative. They were extremely deep, kind of like more philosophical thinkers about one specific obsessive topic at one time. And that ability to obsessively hyper-focus on one topic at a time Maybe not care about what their hair looked like. Maybe not care about what their dress looked like. But they were super focused on that one topic. And that's the reason why they were so innovative. That's the reason why they were able to change science. Change science for the rest of us. For the rest of our earthly years here. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, people with ADHD can be highly creative from music to music production to art to comedy to dance to alchemy even mechanics acting ADHD can be extremely beneficial for individuals who have a leadership potential people with ADHD can be really strong at science and innovation like I mentioned earlier right they have a very strong moral and ethical code oftentimes they're hypersensitive to people's emotions they oftentimes want to make everybody happy so they might be a better diplomat they might be a better um, support tool to actually listen to what other people think you know um, with their connection to nature they might actually care about the environment in other ways that other people don't people, people with ADHD can be highly motivated whenever they get into a hyper obsessive state right they can be perfectionistic in a way that allows them to be um, somewhat obsessive in a negative way sometimes but also perfect perfectionistic in a way to where they're not gonna finish the job until it's done they're going to make sure the job is done to the nth degree to where it's it's perfected as best as what they can do to where it's, it's something so exquisite, so phenomenal that other people wouldn't be able to have gotten there in the same amount of time or effort, okay? They can be eccentric, like I said, with the out-of-box thinking, but, you know, that out-of-box thinking helps us really challenge that status quo and really help us lead out of preconceived notions, out of some sort of a formidable, formidable form of a box that we were in the past and change the changes the dynamics of science or art or healing or our understanding of the world at large that allows us to really leap forward leap forward in economy leap forward in capitalism leap forward in understanding science and and, and how this world really works right that out of the box thinking is one of the best benefits of problem solving because you can take an out of the box um, thought thoughtful perspective on something and really come up with a really novel innovative idea all right so ADHD and nutrition the environment is very important as well okay so talked a lot about the upbringing the positive reinforcement the positive feedback with somebody with ADHD in their environment um, in their upbringing at home at work at school but also their environment around nutrition is also very important so as a kid in school, in home, keeping them involved is very important. That can help them have better health behaviors as they get older. Again, the more senses that we can involve, such as taste, touch, sound, smell. Um, cooking is one of the best ways that we can do that, where it actually engages all senses. There's not many other uh, tools or techniques or, or educational models that work in this way because you don't really taste a pencil unless you put it in your mouth. You don't taste an eraser. You don't taste your art unless you're using, I don't know, Cheerios for art, in which case I would 
suggest you, you don't because Cheerios are high in glyphosate, as an example. Um, but the environment matters. So keeping them, them involved can help their health behaviors down in the, in, down the road in the future. Uh, ensuring there's a safe and comfortable environment, allowing them more for, for more fun, freedom and learning, and adventure with cooking, with food. Avoid high pressure situations. Avoid highly restrictive situations that really suffocates their energy, that really suffocates their brain, causes them a lot of stress and trauma. Teach them how to listen to their brain and their own body around food decisions, food choices, food cravings. Um, listen to their own innate ability to tap into their own intuition. People with ADHD typically have this like hypersensitivity with intuition as well. Um, they can really be they can be really really good cooks. They can be really really good chefs. They can be really really good um, with kind of understanding um, food dynamics as well. Okay, teaching them how food affects their mood can be really really important too. Such as like okay, so how do you feel after you've had this meal? How do you feel now compared to like yesterday when you had only ice cream and cookies after um, afternoon as after your, as your afternoon snack compared to this wholesome almond butter plus blueberry sandwich or something? Okay, we're not asking for perfection with our kids. We're not asking for for perfection with our adult friends either. Hopefully, um, we're just trying to equip them for the future. So again, we're just trying to stay relaxed. We're just trying to equip people. We're just trying to have fun. We're just trying to be creative. We're just trying to Give people nourishing food. I'm like, hey, this is uh, this is what we're doing. We're gonna have some fun, and then we're gonna be done. So, here we go. Load up on all the great foods in the home. Try to leave all the quote unquote junk foods or artificial foods outside of the house because once it's in the house, it becomes habits, right? So, load up on all the good foods, all the colorful fruits and vegetables, all the real whole foods of different plant-based proteins like nuts and seeds, beans and legumes animal-based proteins like eggs, seafood, chicken, turkey, things like that. Um, uh, interrogate your own relationship with food. As an adult, as a parent, as a guardian, as a caretaker, as a teacher, I really, I really want us to think about our own relationship with food. How we think about food, how we feel about food, how we talk about food, how we integrate with food in our homes, because that makes an impact on our kids. It makes an impact on how they think, feel, act, integrate and believe about food in their own life okay so just think about that interrogate your own perspective see where you're at if you need some help talking about that let me know talk about that on a regular basis food choices try to focus on the real whole foods quality proteins over quantity proteins right so we can get a bunch of different kinds of beef jerky we can get all kinds of different protein shakes but those are probably lower quality than higher quality wild caught salmon or um nuts and seeds that are organic, you know, non-GMO oats or non-GMO um, other, other protein sources, healthy fats such as olive oil, avocado, olives, eggs, other things to think about, lots of different colors, eat the rainbow, maybe just not the box of fruity pebbles or the bag of Skittles as an example, but try to include lots of different colors in your diet because different colors equal different nutrients, so try to incorporate a rainbow plate throughout the day, avoid refined grains, Avoid added sugars. Avoid anything artificial. Anything artificial. Dyes, colors, sweeteners, uh, preservatives. Anything artificial. Finger foods kids love. Finger foods adults love, right? So whenever we're kids, we eat, we grow up with chicken nuggets and french fries. Then whenever we are adults, we go to a different kind of restaurant. And then we have chicken wings and potato wedges. It's essentially chicken nuggets and french fries. Again. And so finger foods, people love them at all ages, right? So from the time that we're toddlers at the time that we go to a nursing home and we're treated like toddlers again <laughs> right so everybody loves finger foods just try to keep it creative try, try to keep it exciting um, that way they don't get bored like I said if you keep them involved they'll typically mo be more directive to lead themselves um, so just give them a chance to do that learn their palate learn their palate to say okay what are their textural um, sensitivities here what do they really like from the textural standpoint what kind of flavors do they really enjoy what kind of foods do they really enjoy what kind of styles of eating do they really enjoy maybe they, maybe they really like the soup style maybe they really like um, noodle style maybe they really like a stir fry or a salad or a sandwich um, or a smoothie maybe they really like any of those styles of eating and so we can incorporate healthier foods according to that style that they already enjoy and then focus on diversifying their diet with real whole foods in a way that makes sense for them and their own preferences okay so i'm giving you like prime time gold right now all right this is free content free education that's like prime time gold compared to um signing up um 
for, I don't know, this is probably worth $350 for most people. Um, so take, take notes, okay? Take notes, ask me questions, let me know how I can help with any of these different insights for you and your own personalized approach with your kids at home or your own family or you as an individual, okay? And then last but not least, watch out for food sensitivities. Just keep a log, you know, keep track. If your kid starts to act a little bit outrageous or be behavioral issues after a certain meal, be like, okay, what do we have today? All right, keep that in a log, see if it happens again, keep a log, ask questions, see if you can find any correlations and pattern recognition, okay? All right, ADHD and different forms of therapy. Um, I'm a big fan of breath work. I'm a big fan of brown noise and binaural beats. If you're not, if you never learned about those before, brown noise is like white noise, but it's at a slightly different frequency. That's kind of like an all enveloping um, experience that for the ADHD brain is hard to run away from. The ADHD brain cannot not focus on it. Okay, so it kind of envelops them in this experience. Um, typically. It's kind of like all encompassing, it surrounds them, and it's very relaxing and meditative for them. Binaural beats are essentially just beats that you can find that um, act on different ears independently. So binaural beats can be helpful. Look into like YouTube videos, music um, soundtracks, or um, they have different apps that you can actually listen to different binaural beats as well to keep that brain engaged in different ways. Now, nowadays, there's actually other things like ADHD video games that kids can play for neurofeedback training, um, brain games. There's different apps to help promote focus, to help promote attention, to help promote memory. Um, last but not least, I'm going to mention float tanks. Do you know what a float tank is? If you don't know what a float tank is, pause this video. Go look up on Google. Go float tank. All right, go look into float tanks, see what it is, and be like, oh, okay, that's what a float tank is, and then come back. Okay, now, you, now that you're here, um, a float tank is a really interesting thing that you can go experience. So you essentially, you sit in this tank and typically filled with salt, and then you float. For people with ADHD, for some reason, <laughs> it's kind of like it knocks them out. It makes them sleep. Their body has no um, gravitational pull. Their body has no nothing to grapple onto. So it desensitizes them from the world at large that's constantly stimulating them that they're, that they're holding on to, and their body is finally able to disengage. And they fall asleep, or they relax, or they sit with their thoughts in a way that they've never been able to sit with their thoughts before. Highly meditative, highly relaxing, another, uh, another tool in your toolkit to think about, uh, throwing into the, another variable to throw in there, okay? So ADHD and blank. What else can we talk about? Do we want to talk about blue light? Do we want to talk about light therapy? Do we want to talk about saunas for detoxification? Do we want to talk about genetics? Do we want to talk about sugary cereals? Do we want to talk about water? Do we want to talk about aromatherapy for ADHD? You tell me. What would you like to talk about, friends? I am here to, ask, to answer any questions to the best of my own abilities. We can talk about books. We can talk about ways in which we can communicate to people. I'm here, so ask any questions, okay? I am here to help. In fact, I am only here to help. That is my only and primary objective. I'm only here to help. So. If you have additional questions, let me know. I'm a busy person, so if I don't get back to you in 24 hours, give me some grace, some peace of mind. I will get back to you as soon as possible, um, and I will answer your questions. I might give you a call. I might ask for further information before I try to answer your question better. Ask me your questions. If you need extra help, I do have some opportunities for additional services, additional ways for coaching, additional ways to navigate nutrition. My business model is zigzag nutrition because I believe that we zig and we zag and we adapt and we adjust as we learn more information about our own personal lives and the lives of those around us. And it's a framework of learning, educating, but hopefully the pathway is up and to the right. Hopefully we're moving in this direction as we zig and we zag and we learn to adapt along the way. Okay. So that's my perspective. You learned a lot about me. You learned a lot about ADHD. 
and all the many wonderful, extravagant, remarkable plethora of tools that we have available to us besides medication. I am not a pharmacist, nor do I want to be a pharmacist. Okay? So I have no idea if your medication or a medication is going to be the best option for a kid. What I can tell you is that medication is not the only option. It can be an option. It can be a very helpful option for some people, actually. And they don't ever have any challenges. And they don't ever go on that ADHD roller coaster. And they just are, honestly, sometimes just the outlier, though. They are the minority who don't battle with a lot of different side effects. And it's well-managed. And they don't go through a lot of stress. They don't go through different medication management where they have to go on different dosages through puberty or things that change as they get older. Um, but again, that's the minority. Oftentimes there are side effects. So I'm a fan of working complementary to other physicians, to other services, to other types of treatments, right? So I'm not here to, to demonize one option. I'm here to say, hey, let's just sit down with all these different toys in front of us and let's build a remarkable beautiful future together let's sit down with legos and lincoln logs and magnetics and bionicles and whatever else we can think of right let's sit down with all of those toys and all of those tools and all of those tips and all of those trinkets and opportunities and let's build something together that's going to be best for you that's where i come into this because at the end of the day, I am so motivated by results. I'm so motivated by providing people with the education, information, and empowerment to allow them to build their best life forward. Because I don't want someone to depend on me. In fact, I don't want someone to depend on the healthcare system at all, at large. I want them to be a fully informed citizen, to know what they need to do to adjust, to adapt, their sleep, their nutrition, their lifestyle, their stress management, their physical activity, and so on and so on and so on, their supplements, their friendships, their relationships, to live their best life, to show up in this world, to give their gifts to the rest of the world as best as they can. Because you know what? One of the most frustrating, depressing, um, just, it's really, really sucks. And to see somebody not live up to their full potential, right? So many people with ADHD, whether it's because of an environment, because of a personal perspective they have about themselves, they are not given the chance to live up to their full potential. And if you or someone you know is a loved one, friend or family member who has ADHD, I can almost guarantee you, you have seen them shine. You have seen them be remarkable, theorist or thinker or creative or tinkerer and you're like wow how in the world did you just do that how did you make that how did you come up with that conclusion i i almost guarantee you have seen that person shine at some point and that person deserves to shine in this world with their light that they can provide for uh, others you know you know because we have so many different gifts everybody has different gifts to give to the world at large, okay? So I'm here to help those individuals shine in a better light, all right? So I do have some options here. If you're interested to sign up for more information, for, to sign up for personalized coaching, um, maybe you're interested in additional testing, maybe you're interested in, in looking at different supplement protocols, or you just want me to look at kind of some biomarkers that you have or some labs or want some recommendations around supplements, um, considering like maybe what you're taking now or maybe adjustments you might have. Maybe you need healthy recipe ideas, right? So I can talk to you all day about different kinds of healthy alternative recipes to some common sweets or desserts or favorite foods that people love too, okay? So I'm here to help. If you need additional information, if you want additional information, let me know and I am, I'm available. So if you like this presentation, I would encourage you to share with a friend. I would encourage you to share it online. I put this together for you for a reason. I want it to be a resource that you can go back to over and over and over, whether it's needing more inspiration, more information, or more motivation. I want you to be able to feel free to go back to this, to save this, to like this, to share it, to comment, to ask questions openly and authentically. It's the only way that we're going to actually be able to move the needle in the right direction together as a community, right? I know you know this. I know you know these things to be true. 
So um, willing to have you join me and for me to join you as we progress forward into the future with all these things. Um, and I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your, for your attention and your focus on this presentation today. Um, I hope it's been beneficial for you, and um, I wish you well. Okay, so if you want to reach out, let me know. Like, here, like, sh uh, like, share, and comment anywhere online that you see this video, um, and ask any questions that you have. Okay, thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Care enough. Take care.